Fantastic, what an opportunity. Thank you so much for uh, giving me this chance. So I've got some good news and I've got some bad news. And I want to start out with the good news. We like our good news first. We're living longer. A lot longer, actually. People born in this decade will live almost 10 years longer than those of my vintage. I'm a 1972, in case you wonder. Not only that, but the population of those over the age of 60 is likely to double in the next three decades. Wow, people are definitely living longer. But there's some bad news. The bad news is with longevity comes some risk. Risk that might be physical, risk that might be cognitive. Physical risks like frailty, arthritis, lack of mobility. Cognitive risk, changes in memory, our ability to execute and plan. And these things can even progress to a clinical state or brain disease. Right now in the United States, over six million individuals have been diagnosed with a neurodegenerative disease, something like Alzheimer's or Parkinson's disease. The nexus of this longevity and disease comes when we look at the aging population. Of those 85, 30% will be diagnosable for one of these brain diseases, Parkinson's, Alzheimer's, or both. Kind of scary. The problem is, I feel like I failed you, OK? Because as a scientist, I have not yet been able to identify the cause of these diseases. We've known about these diseases for over a century. And yet, we know it's not genes. I know a lot of people think that, oh, I've got an uncle. I've got a brother somebody with Alzheimer's or Parkinson's disease, I'm going to get it. You aren't. It's not genetic, by and large. It's not toxins. OK, they contribute a little bit, maybe increase the risk factor. But it's not it either. So without knowing what causes these diseases, we can't predict it. And by the time you go see a physician and say, you know what, I've got a tremor. I don't know where it came from. Or my memory just isn't what it used to be you may have lost over 50% of the neurons, these brain cells that are responsible for these functions. Current treatments, they don't change the trajectory of the disease. They just help with the symptoms. They're palliative. That's unfortunate. So we need to make a shift from treatment to prevention. And today what I'd like to argue is we need a strategy that can help us with this. And that strategy, I believe, is something called neuroprotection, protecting your brain. Now, if we take a step back for a moment and we think about what this strategy would look like for us, personally, I would hope that it would be accessible to everybody. My hope is that it would be inexpensive, that it would be global, and by global, I don't mean global economy, global warming. What I mean is global for our brains, that the strategy would protect all facets of our brain. And then finally, and this might be a pipe dream, but I hope that it could be neurorestorative. Neurorestorative meaning that I could stop the progression of the disease or even reverse the ravages of the aging or the disease. OK, what would meet this lofty criteria? What possibly could? Well, to do that, we need to turn to two seemingly disparate or different areas within the field of neuroscience. One, development. Amazing topic. Do you know the things that happen during neural development? We go from one brain cell to 100 billion, that's a B, brain cells in nine months. There are times during neurodevelopment where we create upwards of 250,000 brain cells in one minute. So what the heck is the stimulus that is leading this to happen? That seems like a clue to me. But let's put a bookmark in that and move to the other field, learning and memory. It wasn't that long ago when we thought, once you mature, the brain doesn't change much. 
And in fact, if anything, it just starts falling apart. OK, cool thing. In the last couple decades, scientists have shown that people in their 40s and 50s and 60s and 70s can continue to make new brain cells throughout their life. Now, what causes this to happen? Well, it turns out that as we interact with our environment, we need new neural pathways. This is how we learn. And this is how we create memories. We need these new brain cells. What's the stimulus that is leading us to create new brain cells throughout our life? And it turns out, from this field and from this field, there's one thing that's common. And it's neurotrophins. Neurotrophins. Let's take a look at the word for a second. Neuro of the brain, central nervous system. Trophins, grower, nourisher. These are molecules that we find within our brains. We all have them, or you wouldn't be here. I'm telling you right now. OK? We all have these things. And these are incredibly important for helping neurons to be born, for helping them to survive, and helping them to integrate. That means creating new neural networks. What an amazing stimulus these things are. And I have a video here that I would like to show you if I could. Let's see if I can make the magic happen. Here we go. What you're looking at here are stem cells. These are young cells that haven't decided what they're going to be yet. Okay? But what we're going to do is we're going to add one of these neurotrophins to these cells. And I want you to watch what happens. Check it out. They move. They grow. And they send out processes. And they start talking to each other. And in fact, they begin to make the beginnings of a neural network. What's the stimulus? Neurotrophins. So how can I get me some neurotrophins? <laughs> Great question. You can't take a neurotrophin pill. And there aren't great drugs for neurotrophins. And in fact, if neurotrophins are delivered to the wrong cells, you can get the proliferation, the growth of the wrong kind of cell. And we all know what that is, right? Cancer. So we've got to have a strategy that augments or increases neurotrophins from within. From within. We need some strategy that does that. This takes us to the next place in our investigation. A place, a strange place, far away. A place even colder than Binghamton, New York. <laughs> it can't happen. Minnesota. Yes, that's right, Minnesota. In the 1980s, there was a researcher, David Snowden, who was looking to understand why it was that some people got Alzheimer's disease and some people didn't. In Minnesota, there was a convent of sisters who were concerned because they watched as their fellow nuns came down with Alzheimer's disease and eventually died. Coincidence would have it that they came together. And the women said, Dr. Snowden, we have data for you. Over a 1,000 people's worth of data. We've got writing samples from when our women started in the convent. We have their lifestyle through the decades. We know when they died. We know what they died from. Would you be interested in looking at And he said, don't, you don't need to say anything more. I'm loving this. And he got one more thing that made his work groundbreaking. He was able to get them to consent to giving their brains. So he had this rich data set from which to work. And he was able to look at those that got Alzheimer's and those that didn't. Looked at what predicted it. And what he found was women who engaged in complex cognitive activities were protected from Alzheimer's disease. Now, he had the brains looking to confirm that the brains would actually look different from one another. And here's the crazy part. When he looked, the asymptomatic and the symptomatic brains actually looked about the same. The women who were protected actually had Alzheimer's pathology, some of them, and yet remain untouched by the disease. They had created more complex neural networks. The compensation and neuroplasticity that came from what we now know based on basic science is neurotrophins 
allowed them to stave off the expression of the disease. And that's amazing. So my first main point is, what strategy could we use? Cognitive exercise. Exercise your brains. Engage in complex activities. Read new things. Continue your education. Maybe even eventually, sometimes play complex video games. I'm cool with that. All right, there's some evidence that stuff can work too. Learn a new instrument. Try something different. Okay, these things work. But there's one more strategy that I would like to leave you with that perhaps is even more powerful than cognitive exercise. Right now, roughly 400 yards from here, in one of the science buildings, I have rats. Those rats love to run. They will run 10 kilometers a day if given the opportunity. What do they know that we don't know? And it turns out physical exercise is one of the most potent stimulators of neurotrophins that we know. Physical exercise, that good old physical exercise. Basic neuroscience has shown this over and over again. And there's very strong evidence that physical exercise is fantastic at delaying brain disease or even slowing brain disease. Now the work in humans is just starting. Believe it or not, this work is very new. One of my favorite studies comes from Pittsburgh where they had a group of individuals in their 60s and they said, okay, we're gonna make your groups roughly equal. Okay, we're gonna split you into three. Group number one, you're going to be sedentary for a year. Aww. All right, group two, stretching. Oh, that sounds lovely, okay? And group three was gonna get moderate exercise. Oh, exercise, really? It's not that bad, okay? They followed them through a year and they had different variables they used to determine what the effects of their conditions were. What they found was this. One group was somewhat different. Not surprisingly, the physical exercise group was more physically fit. But they were also far better at cognitive tasks. They put these people into scanners, and the areas of the brain responsible for learning and memory were larger. And that correlated with one biological assay in particular, one biological sample, neurotrophins. Neurotrophins. So it seems to me that our strategy of neuroprotection, whether it be cognitive exercise or physical exercise, could be accessible. That it could be inexpensive. Buy that swimsuit and goggles, get out there and swim. Global, especially physical exercise, amazing for the brain. Neurorestorative, that remains to be seen, okay? But one of my colleagues, Dr. Lisa Savage, right now is testing the effects of exercise in a neurologic disease, and she's finding amazing functional recovery with physical exercise, and that could work for us too. But I have one final caveat for you today, and the neuroscience research bears this out as well. This cannot be other than sustained, challenging, and varied. You gotta push yourself or this stuff will not work. This isn't a talk about the future. This is a talk about right now. So neuroprotect yourself and exercise your brain. Thanks. <laughs>